Get ready to enter Milgwyn Palace, reach into Mikola's cocoon, and cross the veil into the Land of Shadow in the Elden Ring Shadow of the Urtree DLC. If you're confused by most of what I just said, then this is the video for you. Unless you were taking copious notes and talking to every NPC in the main game, or you have Vati Vidya content constantly playing in the background, you might be a little lost as to what in the fingers is actually going on in the lands between. Here is a story recap to get you caught up on the main plot beats and characters you should know before tackling Shadow of the Earth Tree, as well as what questions you should be asking yourself when you get your hands on the DLC. Get ready for a ton of proper nouns and spoilers for Elden Ring's story. The story of Elden Ring at its core is about immortal beings vying to exert their dominance and using mortal creatures like pieces on their intergalactic chessboard. These immortal beings are known as the Outer Gods, the most important to the story of Elden Ring being the Greater Will. The Outer Gods cannot directly meddle in the mortal realm. In order to do so, the Greater Will sent down a creature that would come to be known as the Elden Beast, a being that is the living manifestation of order itself. It's unclear as to when and how it happened, but eventually the Elden Beast turned into the Elden Ring, a nebulous concept that would permeate throughout the world and define its laws. The one chosen to become the vassal of the Elden Ring, and by extension a vassal of the Greater Will itself, was Marika of the Numen, ostensibly humans from distant lands, but with a far greater lifespan and a seemingly lesser ability to procreate. Mortal creatures that have the ability to ascend into godhood and become the vassal for the Elden Ring are known as Empyreans, chosen by the Greater Will's envoys, the Two Fingers, with Marika being one such individual. Empyreans are given a shadow, creatures that do the bidding of their masters, and Marika's shadow is Malekith. Essentially able to shape the laws of the world to her will, Marika removed one of the many runes that comprised the Elden Ring and gave it to Malekith for safekeeping. This rune is known as Destined Death, and its removal from the Elden Ring essentially meant that death itself no longer existed under Marika's domain. In doing so, she also created the Golden Order, a religious movement that would see her as a god and many of the old ways viewed as blasphemous. Using the Elden Ring, Marika also gave life to the Erd Tree, a monument to the Golden Order and the entity that souls travel to and from. With Marika trying to bend the world to her will, this undoubtedly did not sit right with many of the different factions that resided within it. As such, countless wars were waged between Marika's forces and opposing groups, most notably the Dragons, Fire Giants, and the Sorcerers of Rhea Lucaria and Caria. Leading Marika's army was Hora Lu, known to many as the most fearsome warrior in existence. Eventually, Marika wed Hora Lu and crowned him as Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. After defeating the Fire Giants, Marika had cemented her dominance over the realm. This was the beginning of the Age of the Erd Tree, which gave shape to the game's setting, The Lands Between. With no more foes left to vanquish, Godfrey was exiled from the Lands Between by Marika to wage new wars in lands not yet conquered. Stripped of his grace of gold, essentially a blessing of the Erd Tree, Godfrey became the first tarnished and returned to simply being the warrior Horolu. After the pesky fire giants and dragons were taken care of, there was another warring faction on Marika's list who just couldn't seem to be conquered, the sorcerers of Caria and Leonia. Heading the Academy of Rhea Lucaria was Renala, who had found magic through channeling the moon. However, Renala ended up falling in love with the leader of Marika's forces, Radigan. The two wed and had several children, their union bringing about an end to the conflict. The thing is, Radigan and Marika are actually one and the same person. How this is possible, and whether Radigan was initially a separate person that merged with Marika, Marika intentionally became Radigan to trick Renala, or the two genuinely fell in love is still a mystery to this day. 
While Marika was wed to Renala as Radigan, Marika herself required a consort now that Godfrey was out of the picture, so she simply married herself, or to be more specific, her literal better half Radigan. From the outside, this looked like a major betrayal, and Queen Renala was so stricken with grief, she practically stopped functioning, locking herself away. Meanwhile, Leonia was now allied with Radigan, Marika, and the Golden Order. It was a cunning victory for Marika. Somehow, even though they're the same person, Marika and Radigan were able to consummate their marriage and had two children, Mikola and Melania. How this is possible is unclear, but what is known is that their children are afflicted with ailments. Mikola, golden-haired like Marika, is cursed with eternal youth, and Melania, red-headed like Radigan, is plagued with scarlet rot. Mikola and Melania are not the only children Radigan had. The second Elden Lord conceived several children with his former partner Renala, the most consequential of which being their daughter Rani. In short, Rani was not a fan of Marika or the Golden Order, and wished to upend the rule of the Greater Will. In order to do so, she managed to steal a fragment of the Rune of Death from Malekith, and imbued its power into the Black Knives of Numen Assassins. She did this in order to strip herself of Empyrean status, rejecting her Golden Lineage. This required two deaths one of spirit and one of body. The death of the body would be her own, the death of the spirit would be of another. In an event simply known as the Night of Black Knives, the assassins killed the spirit of Godwin the Golden, one of Marika's children that she had with the first Elden Lord Godfrey. The grief at the loss of her son drove Marika into a rage that resulted in the shattering of the Elden Ring itself, throwing the lands between into chaos. For her actions, Marika was imprisoned within the Erd Tree itself, presumably by the Elden Beast, which regained its physical form with the destruction of the Elden Ring. The shattered ruins would fall into the hands of the various demigods' children and relatives of Marika, driving them into an endless war for the crown of Elden Lord. With no demigod able to take up the mantle and restore order to the lands between, the Greater Will turned its attention to the Tarnished, restoring their grace of gold, and providing them with a goal. Collect the runes from the warring demigods, and assume the duties of the Elden Lord. This is where the game itself begins, the player embodying one of the many Tarnished tasked with this quest. The only problem is that the player Tarnished is maidenless, meaning they are without a maiden to aid them in their journey. That is, until a mysterious woman by the name of Melina offers to fulfill that duty in return for one thing, to be brought to the foot of the Erd Tree. After defeating numerous demigods and collecting their runes, the Tarnished seeks out a way to burn the thorns surrounding the Erd Tree. This goal brings them face to face with another of Marika and Godfrey's children, Morgot, once banished to a subterranean realm due to his cursed omen of blood. With the shattering, he returned to the surface to prevent the traitors he viewed his demigod relatives to be, as well as any Tarnished, from claiming the title of Elden Lord. Once the player Tarnished has bested Morgot, they are able to traverse to the mountaintops of the giants where they are able to claim the Fire Giant's power. Depending on the player's choices, Elden Ring can end in one of several ways. Multiple endings result in the player becoming the Elden Lord, with slight variations depending on certain outcomes and completion of side quests. Two endings, however, result in a complete rejection of the Greater Will. The first is the Age of Stars. Over the course of the game, the Tarnished can encounter Rani, and when faced with the ability to wield the Elden Ring however they see fit, they can ultimately choose to gift its power to Rani herself. In this ending, the Tarnished still becomes Elden Lord, but also consort to the true ruler Rani, who has undone the Golden Order and removed the influence of the Greater Will from the lands between. The second alternate ending is known as the Lord of Frenzied Flame. When acquiring the flame to burn the thorns surrounding the Erd Tree, the player can choose to side with the Frenzied Flame, another outer god that is ostensibly the opposite of the Greater Will, wishing to return the Lands Between to a primordial state of chaos. Regardless of which ending the player chooses, they end up determining the fate of the entire Lands Between. So, how does all this factor into Shadow of the Erd Tree? 
The expansion actually takes place during the events of the main game. As a result, any ending that the player chose has no consequence on the expansion, and in turn, the expansion has no result on the ending of Elden Ring. Think of it as a massive side quest that was previously unobtainable. Shadow of the Earth Tree looks to expand on characters previously only teased in the main game, as well as explain some of the history of Marika and how she came into becoming a god. The main figure of the expansion is Mikola, one of Marika's two children that she had with Radigan, the one plagued with eternal youth. Mikola had wished to discover a cure for his sister Melania's Scarlet Rot, this search causing him to turn away from the Golden Order when he discovered that it could provide no solutions. His quest led him to grow the Halig Tree, which he intended to ultimately supplant the Ur Tree itself. But before he could fuse himself and his power with it, he was kidnapped by Moog, another child of Marika that she had with Godfrey. Moog is yet another demigod that rejected the Greater Will. At some point, Moog made contact with the Formless Mother, another outer god, and began serving it. Moog, himself not an Empyrean, hoped to make Mikola his consort and become a monarch through marriage. In order to raise Mikola up to the point where he would be powerful enough to assume the mantle, he seemingly stuck him in some kind of cocoon. Somehow, that cocoon ultimately transported Mikola to the Land of Shadow, the region that the players will explore in Shadow of the Earth Tree and follow in the Empyrean's footsteps. Pre-release material hints that Mikola had desired to reach the Land of Shadows, and therefore, was he potentially plotting with Moog all along? There is a lot that we still don't know about the Land of Shadow, which seems to also be the case for many in the Lands Between. It seems that Marika went to great lengths to hide its existence, as it seems part of her ascending into Godhood most likely required a great war that she raged alongside Mesma the Impaler, another potential child of hers who was left behind to seemingly guarded secrets. We have a video from our Elden Ring experts breaking down the story trailer if you want some additional information, but here are some key questions you should be asking yourself before jumping into the expansion. One of the questions we hope Elden Ring answers is about Melina, the woman who acts as a surrogate for the player's maiden in the main game. It's heavily hinted that she is yet another child of Marika, but we don't know for sure. Perhaps both she and Mesma were fathered by the same person? The Shadow of the Urge Tree trailer teases the appearance of Saint Trina, a character merely referred to multiple times over the course of the main game that has powers over dreams. She is heavily linked to Mikola, and considering that the theme of duality is at Elden Ring's core, perhaps they are one and the same. Of course, the biggest question going into Shadow of the Earth Tree is what is Mikola up to? Did he willingly team up with Moog? And what did his mother Marika do in the Land of Shadow that she is trying to hide so badly? Is it simply the war that she waged alongside Mesma, or is it something even more sinister? Does it have something to do with her ascension into Godhood? We don't have to wait long to see what answers and what new questions Shadow of the Earth Tree provides, as the game releases on June 21st. For more on the expansion, including guides and our eventual review, stay right here on GameSpot.